Well, good morning. I thought that was worth a few extra minutes today for that video to remind us, you know, sometimes life is uncomfortable. Sometimes we go through pain and heartache even when we obey God. This week, Peter Lord took the jump to heaven. And uh, when I think of the port ministry, by the way, Steve, thank you so much for sharing again. We're, you'll have to read some of the responses online, but, um, and you may get some emails at your new email there, steve at thesurfsidefellowship.com. Uh, but Peter Lord took that jump this week. Harold Brantley, who was my mentor for many years, uh, went to be with the Lord uh, about a year ago, and he helped start the port ministry years ago. Just so many people. What's neat to think about is the Bible says that great cloud of witnesses is cheering us on. So Peter Lord gets to cheer me on today and wonder why I use that sermon illustration. But it'll be a good start. Um, you ever uncomfortable? You ever wonder why you're struggling with something and you think, well, God, I'm doing what you want me to do. Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? You know, Jesus uses quite a few terms to talk about what it means to follow him. And one of them is about being pruned. And those of you who are, how many of you would say you're decent with plants? You have a green thumb. Okay, how many like me would say you have a brown thumb? I have a brown thumb, maybe even a black thumb. You come to my house. I can tell you which plants you can plant in Florida, and they will survive. Um, so, so here's what happens. You know, our lives sometimes are like this little bitty pot. We start as new Christians, and we, we start to grow, and, and, uh, and God sees that we're growing. And then he takes us, and he gets some new soil, and puts us in a new pot, a little bigger pot, and then maybe even a bigger pot. But let me tell you what happens when you transplant a plant to grow. If that plant could talk to you, it would say, I don't like this. A lot of times when you take a plant from a little pot and put it in a bigger pot, its first reaction is to go into shock and even lose some limbs to when the gardener has to come in and prune some of that off as it goes to something bigger. Listen, if God is going to do something new with you, if God is going to do something bigger with you, if he's going to use you to make a difference in somebody's life, there will be times of pruning. There will be times of transplanting. And I can tell you, you have a choice. And you can say to God, put me back in the little pot. And I think that sometimes God says, okay. You, you don't want to serve me. You don't want to be obedient. And he allows us to do that. But the truth is, if we want to see God's will be done, we have to go through those times of suffering and struggle. The series verses, Exodus 4, 2 and 3, the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? A staff. Just a simple staff, he said. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake, and he ran from it. By the way, it would have been nice if God had given him a little warning, right? Wouldn't it be nice God just gave you a heads up? Hey, next week's going to be tough. I'm just going to give you a little heads up. It's happen no, no, pop quizzes all day long, all day long, pop quizzes. So even when you obey God, life is sometimes tough. But let me tell you something about America and us as Christians. The truth for us as Americans is we value comfort over commitment to Christ. And the reason the church in America is not exploding with new people who are desiring to do God's will and people running in the door saying, I need what you have, is because as soon as we get uncomfortable, God asks us to do something. He asks us to step out and then we have to deal with other people. And the pruning begins. We say, well, forget it. I'm not doing that anymore. We would rather be comfortable than committed to God's next step for us. You know, I've done that before. I served in the past. I did what God wanted me to in the past. Can I tell you something? You're here for a purpose and for a reason. And if you choose comfort over commitment, you're choosing to defy what God wants to do in your life. Because here's the news. When God puts you in a bigger pot, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. But the fruit is more and more. So if you've been through a hard time, don't think, why do I go through this and nobody else does? Because God wants to bring fruit from your life. So here's three things. You're not going to like any of them. You'll like the third one. Number one, you may suffer. When you trust God, you may suffer. Exodus chapter 5, we're picking up here. You're going to have to read some in between. I couldn't read every single verse this week, but you can. Here we go. Exodus chapter 5, verse 14 to 18. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed. 
demanding, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Time out. If you missed last week's sermon, we're going to go back for just a second. Remember, Moses and Aaron show up to Pharaoh, basically say, we want to go. And he said, fine, I'm not letting you go. Not only that, no more straw for you. And he made it worse. Moses and Aaron did what God wanted them to do, and it made it worse for everybody. Sometimes when you obey God, that's exactly what happens. Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we're told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. You ever feel like life's unfair? Other people don't suffer, and you do. Other people don't struggle, and you do. Why? Because God may be preparing you for something new. God was preparing them. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw. You must produce your full quota of bricks. See, when life begins to change, when God begins to do something new in your life, listen, God had told them, I'm paying attention. Things are going to change. And they had to be thinking, that means it's easy. Nay, nay. When God begins to move in your life, oftentimes it's like medicine. We went to Pella, Iowa to do Randy's wedding. Got to be out there in Pella. And we went to lunch one day, Kristen and I, back in the old days when you could go to lunch. And we got a sandwich, and we ate that sandwich, and about a half hour later, Kristen and I were walking around the beautiful streets of Pella, Iowa, where they have a windmill, a windmill, an original windmill brought in from Holland. This people are crazy, but it's wonderful. And we were walking around town, and all of a sudden, I looked at Kristen, and I said, hey, um, I think something is wrong with my tongue. She said, what? I said, I don't know. What was in that sandwich? She said, well, it had turkey. And it had avocado, and I went, blah, 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 blah. did you say that sandwich had avocado? Because I'm noticing that I'm starting to not be able to breathe, and that my tongue is very swollen. I think we better find a CBS pharmacy. So if you've ever seen the scene in Hitch, this was very similar. My face started breaking out. We walked into the CBS pharmacy. Excuse me, where's your Benadryl? And I went and got better. Before I got to, the, I have never do this. Before I got to the counter, I poked a hole in the top of the Benadryl and put it down. Look, 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 look. Look like my grandfather. That's another story. But anyway, so, right? And the Benadryl goes in. And what happens about a half hour later? The allergy goes away. I'm so much better. What happens when you take medicine? You might get worse. Before you get better. I had to be sleepy. Now, I could have said, Christian, I'm not taking that Benadryl. What are you, crazy? It'll make me sleepy. And we're having such a good time today, walking around here. It's the summer, and it's 75 degrees. It's just wonderful we're walking around. So I can make it. I'll be okay. I don't need to take anything. I'll be fine. Breathing is optimal. <laughs> and yet we do that with God. God, I don't, I don't need your... I, I'm going to make this on my own. And we wonder in our struggle why we're struggling. It's because God may be doing something new. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You ever been in surrounded? That means surrounded in the Greek. You ever been surrounded by trials? It seems like one after the other after the other. I've had a few people this year that I've said, Wow, you've had quite a year. Consider it joy. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That means staying power. It means being under a weight. Let perseverance finish your work. Why? So you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is give thanks to God for helping you to mature. I have Christian friends who are missionaries, and they told me that in their community, when somebody becomes a Christian, they are literally kicked out off the family farm. And when they go to those people and they say to them, are you doing okay? Is there any way we can help you? And sometimes they help them with food. Sometimes they help them with shelter. But those people over and over say, I just consider it joy that I could suffer for the Lord. You know, in America, we celebrate comfort. Very rarely do we celebrate difficulty. So take a moment and thank God for helping you to mature. Number two, you may become discouraged. 
you may become discouraged. Now, anybody who's tried to exercise knows exactly what this is like. You think you're going to go and run a block, right? So you go out on the street and you start to run and you start to exercise and then you see a stop sign and your body says, you know, that's a good place to stop. That's a good impact. I mean, it says stop on it. You should really obey that. And your body's crying out, what are you, crazy? Why are you making me move like this? And if you're not careful, you'll stop at that stop sign and you'll suddenly go, oh, wow, I made it 50 yards. I really didn't make it around the block. Because when we do things that are healthy, sometimes we become discouraged. When we do things that are spiritually healthy, sometimes when we've given that energy, we've given that away, and even done what we feel like God wants us to do, and we're attacked, we become discouraged. But that's been going on for 4,000 years. God hasn't changed. In Exodus 6, God reminds them, I will take you as my own people. I'll be your God. Then you'll know I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I'll bring you the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So God encouraged Moses, and Moses thought, well, this is a great idea. And then it says this. Moses then goes to the Israelites, and he reports this. Hey, God wanted to lift you up. And listen to what it says. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. If you're not careful in the middle of difficulty, you won't listen to what God is saying to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if my own church won't listen to me, I'm sorry. If, my, if the Israelites won't listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? since I speak with faltering lips. Spurgeon, who preached this sermon in the 1800s, said around him people often had so much difficulty that no matter what he said, it did not get through. That's one of the reasons we do things like the port ministry, where we help lift people up. We, we release some of their burden, whether it's feeding them or bringing them packages or getting their mail or bringing the gospel on a ship or a DVD in their own language about the Jesus story. What are we doing? We're lifting them up. Why? So they can hear. So they can hear. In 1 Peter, it says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that come to you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. Listen, God, Jesus calls it pruning. The Bible talks about refiner's fire. And what do I want? I want massaging and refiner's jacuzzi. Anytime things get difficult, I think, well, what have I done wrong? Maybe I need to stop helping. Maybe I need to stop doing. Pastors quit every single weekend. I know pastors who Sunday afternoon left church, sent an email and said, I'm done. And sent it to the church. Resign that day. The enemy's going to try to do that to you every day. And then it continues. But rejoice. Inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And that's going in to my next point. Remember, it's not about comfort. It's about commitment. Ask God to help you see past discouragement to his glory. Because when you're plowing a field, it's hard work. When you're planting a tree, it's hard work. When your life is being pruned, when God's replanting you, it's difficult, it's hard, it's discouraging. You think nothing's going to happen, but God says, pay attention, I'm going to bring fruit from the seeds you plant. Your worst experience in life will never be wasted. God never wastes a hurt. Let him use that. To be a blessing to somebody else. And then finally today, number three, God keeps his promises for eternity. One day we're all going to jump out of the plane. Have we been uncomfortable in our lives with the parachute that is God's saving grace? Have we lived it out so that one day we close our eyes here and the next day or that moment we open our eyes in heaven and say, oh, hi, Jesus. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say next week, next year, next month, if you behave enough, if Eric lights some candles, maybe you'll make it. He said, no, no, today you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because he trusted him. The thief on the cross was never baptized, never was able to do the things that we think are required. What did he do? He put his trust in Jesus. And so he went to sleep on this earth 
in pain and struggle and opened his eyes in heaven with no more pain, no more suffering, no more dying, no more getting out of bed and going, oh, oh, oh. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials. It became a snake. Pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptians magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. Sometimes when you do what God wants you to do, somebody will come against you and say, who do you think you are? Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake, but I love this. This is how good God is. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them. Listen. Just as the Lord, he said. What's he saying? God told you that's what's going to happen. And God told you that you're saved by grace. God told you that if you trust in Jesus, you will not perish but have eternal life. That is his promise. So I know that when Peter Lord this week went to sleep here, he opened his eyes in heaven next to Harold Brantley and and his wife, uh, Johnny Lord, and in the arms of Christ. For our light and momentary troubles, it says in 2 Corinthians, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Someday all of these troubles are going to be nothing. You're, you're gonna, it's, you know, it's like birthing pains. Like Women are like, oh, this is awful, I can't believe it. So beautiful. <laughs> My sister has 10 children by natural birth. That means that nine times she said, let's do this again. I'm like, you've got a teenager? She's like, yeah. And now you have a newborn. When we get to heaven, it's going to be like that. We're going to think about our worst moment here, and it's going to be nothing in the light of how good God is to us. That's the promise he gives us. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The reason my friends in Nepal could share with the people of Nepal is because when they first got to Nepal, their son almost died. They were called as missionaries. He had left his practice. He had left uh, an engineer at a big space firm where he was making a lot of money and doing the George Jefferson moving on up. And he felt like God called him to the mission field. He went there and their son was dying. Had a huge, uh, terrible fever. I remember getting an email. And we began praying. And God healed their son. But before that, Brett's wife said, hey, God, you've brought us here. And so no matter what happens, we're going to serve you. A few days later, their son was healed and survived the mission field. But every time somebody lost a home, every time somebody lost a neighbor, every time one of the people that became a Christian suffered because of it, they were able to say, we understand suffering. We've struggled. Have you struggled? God can use that struggle to help you, to help someone else, to help you to grow, to put you in a new place where he is going to continue to help you grow. So finally, thank God for his eternal reward of heaven. I want to encourage you. Don't value comfort as Americans over true Christianity following Christ. Don't value comfort over your commitment to Christ. Say, God, what do you want me to do? And then walk it out, even if that makes you uncomfortable. You might have to come to church a little early to greet people. You might have to work with children that actually cry. You, you may actually do something that other people not only don't appreciate, somebody may say, who do you think you are? Guess what? That's just a taste of the suffering of Christ. And as we do that, the Bible says, as we're committed to him, what happens? We grow. We change. And what happens because of that? The fruit that your life bears overflows. So don't stay in the same bucket. Don't give up because it's hard. If you're struggling right now, don't think it's weird that something's happening to you. Know that God can use that very struggle so that you can help other people find their way home to Christ. 
If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, or if you're watching online don't have a relationship with Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to Jesus who died because we're sinners, surrendered his life for us, so that when we say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you, I believe you died and rose on a cross, so that I rose out of the grave so I could have a relationship with you. When we surrender our life to him, the Bible says he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. If you've already done that, give him thanks for that today and then walk out in obedience to his commands. And if you haven't done that, I'd love to talk to you about those next steps of surrendering to him. If you've never taken the next step of baptism, you can sign up in the back and say, I want to get baptized. We're going to be doing that next month. We'll have baptism. We've also had a request to have some baptisms at the beach, so we're going to do both. And if you want to get baptized, you can do that. Somebody's already said, can we be baptized in our pool? I said, absolutely. Is it warm? I asked it after, after. Just take that next step of what God wants you to do, whether it's serve somewhere, love somebody, reach out, whatever it is, just take that next step of commitment. Let's end in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for so many who go out to the port ministry and are uncomfortable. They go out of their way. They use their resources. They surrender their lives to even be criticized, to sometimes feel like what they're doing doesn't matter. But Lord, you use them. Father, for those here who do things for others and are not only not appreciated, but sometimes attacked for what they've done, Father, I pray that your spirit will remind us we are never alone. No matter what we do, your spirit's with us. Strengthen those who right now are going through the pruning, who right now are going through the transplanting. Give them your strength and wisdom and help them not to give up, but to continue to do what you've called them to do. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.